everyone and welcome. I'm Maggie Mahan, the Assistant Director for Community Engagement with the State Historical Society of Missouri. And I have the pleasure of welcoming you today. And for many of you, welcoming you back. Thanks so much for joining us as art curator, Dr. Joan Stack presents Battle Lines, the story of World War II through the editorial cartoons of Daniel Fitzpatrick. As the St. Louis Post dispatches two-time Pulitzer Prize winning cartoonist, Fitzpatrick chronicled the progression of World War II as it happened with powerful and poignant editorial cartoons. Today's program covers all three installments of Battle Lines, the World War II cartoons of Daniel Fitzpatrick that have been featured in SHSMO's art gallery. All events in our virtual programming series are made possible thanks to the generous support of the State Historical Society of Missouri's members and donors. Please visit our website at shsmo.org to learn more and see how you can add your support by joining or renewing your membership or making a gift. Thank you again for joining us. And now I will turn it over to Joan. Well, thank you so much, uh, Maggie. Well, our program today, as Maggie mentioned, is called Battle Lines, the story of World War II through the editorial cartoons of Daniel Fitzpatrick. And I am Joan Stack, the curator of art collections at the State Historical Society of Missouri. And I will be your host uh, for this uh, journey through the cartoons of World War II by Fitzpatrick. And here's the man of the hour. As many of you may know, this exhibit features a prize collection at the State Historical Society of Missouri of roughly 2000 editorial cartoons donated to SHSMO by the two-time Pulitzer Prize winning cartoonist for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. Daniel Fitzpatrick is seen here in a photograph from 1919, and he's there at his easel working on a cartoon. You can see how big they are. Now, a selection of our Fitzpatrick cartoons appeared in the three-part exhibition, Battle Lines, the World War II cartoons of Daniel Fitzpatrick, which was the inaugural ex exhibition in the Guitar Family Gallery of Editorial Cartoons and Illustrations at the State Historical Society of Missouri's New Art Gallery which is within the new Center for Missouri Studies building, which opened in August of 2019. So let's start with the introductory text of the exhibition. Uh, so I'm give, gonna read a portion of that here. Uh, between 1939 and 1945, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch's award-winning editorial cartoonist, Daniel Fitzpatrick, chronicled the progress of World War II with powerful and poignant images that appeared almost daily on the paper's editorial pages. The three installments of this year-long exhibition present a selection of original drawings for published cartoons in which Fitzpatrick provided visual commentary for World War II as it happened. So we begin with part one, the onset of war with one of the exhibition's most powerful cartoons. Next, which appeared on August 24th, 1939. So this cartoon ran eight days before World War II officially began with Germany's invasion of Poland on September 1st, 1939. On August 23rd, 1939, Germany and the Soviet Union had signed a non-aggression pact. So without fear that Russia would object, Hitler was now free to extend his blitzkrieg across the Polish frontier. So Fitzpatrick visualizes Hitler's forces as a swastika shaped steamroller ready to crush the Polish nation at any moment. This ominous symbol of the Nazis became one of Fitzpatrick's most famous visual tropes. And the artist used the image throughout the war to represent the Nazis fighting triumphs and setbacks. 
So SHSMO has many original drawings featuring the steamroller, which could in fact make an interesting small exhibition for the future. And you will see this symbol several more times during this presentation. So this cartoon is entitled Save America First, and it is one of several isolationist cartoons that appeared uh, early on in the war. It ran on January 25th, 1940. And it reminds us that as World War II began, many middle Americans had reservations about joining a European war when the US faced serious social and economic problems of its own. And Fitzpatrick initially sympathized with these ideas. And here he shows a figure standing on the East Coast of a stylized US map holding a banner emblazoned with the words, save Europe. Now towards the center of the map, symbolic figures representing mass unemployment, corrupt officials, buccaneering business and labor racketeers stand beneath a pillar of billowing smoke labeled $42 billion debt. So by the end of 1941, Fitzpatrick would abandon these isolationist attitudes, which you see here in this particular cartoon, but not yet. Uh, here we have another isolationist cartoon. It's entitled European War Zone Buoy, and it ran on January 31st, 1941. So before the US entered World War II, American naval convoys that entered the European war zone risked being attacked by Axis forces. Many feared that such an attack would eventually prompt America to enter World War II, just as the sinking of the Lusitania had led the nation to enter World War I. So when Roosevelt sent a British aid bill to Congress in January of 1941, the editors of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch made an argument that Congress should ban American naval convoys in the bill to avoid provoking Hitler. Now in Fitzpatrick's image of the European war zone, a skull has become a buoy, a floating marker used to indicate navigation hazards. And here I show you World War II era buoys in Australian waters in 1943. Now in this case, the hazard is the death of thousands of Americans that would come if a sunken American ship led the US to enter the war. Now this cartoon ran on June 30th, 1941, and its title is Strange Evangelist. It was published just a few days after June 22nd, 1941, the date when Germany gave up its 1939 non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union and launched an invasion of Russia. Nazi propaganda at this time promoted the war against the Soviet Union as a holy crusade against atheistic Bolshevism. Meanwhile, accounts of religious persecution in Nazi territories had become more sinister and frequent. So Fitzpatrick represents this hypocrisy with a figure of a giant Nazi crushing a church and a synagogue with one hand while holding up a sign reading Holy War on Russia in the other. Now this cartoon is even more sinister than the last one we looked at and it reflects the growing a recognition of Americans that things were getting very dire and very dangerous in Europe, especially under Hitler uh, during this period. Of course, similar things were also happening in Japan, but I think the realization of the horror of Hitler was uh, one of the things that really uh, changed a lot of people's minds about the war. This cartoon is entitled Harvest, and it ran on July 6th, 1941. And here Fitzpatrick presents a grim agricultural analogy between the harvesting of crops and the harvesting of human lives. So in the cartoon, a Nazi harvester resembles the mechanized farm equipment 
that had been introduced in the 20th century to make agriculture more efficient and productive. So Fitzpatrick's audience would, have, would be familiar with such machines, such as that depicted in Thomas Hart Benton's 1948 painting, Cradling Wheat. Now Fitzpatrick's vision reflects the reality that in the modern age, modern war machines made killing horrifically efficient, especially when combined with Hitler's ruthless ambition. So I told you, you would see Fitzpatrick's swastika shaped steam roller again. And this time it is mired in mud in a cartoon entitled The Difficult Road to Moscow, which ran on July 28, 1941. Uh, this cartoon serves as a prescient emblem of the difficulties Germany encountered when it gave up that 1939 non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union and launched an invasion of Russia codenamed Operation Barbarossa. The Red Army proved a formidable foe for Germany and by the end of July, when this cartoon appeared, it was clear that Hitler's plans for a quick victory had been foiled. And by the winter of 1941-42, the Nazis were forced to retreat westward away from Moscow. And this failure, the failure of Operation Barbarossa represented a turning point in the war, playing a key role in Hitler's ultimate defeat. And that brings us to this cartoon, Scorched Earth, which ran on September 22nd, 1941. And it too has something to do with the invasion of Russia. Because the day after the Nazis launched that invasion, Soviet leader Joseph Stalin pledged that his people would not give up. They would employ a scorched earth policy against the Germans. If enemy soldiers gained ground, no food or fuel would be left behind for their use. Forests, stores, and transports would all be burned. And by September 22nd, 1941, this policy had left wide swaths of Russia blackened and desolate. So Fitzpatrick's cartoon represents the environmental costs of this scorched earth policy as we see a swastika burnt into the fabric of the globe, suggesting that Hitler is ultimately responsible for this humanitarian and ecological disaster. Now this cartoon ran on October 23rd, 1941, and its title is Full Speed Ahead. And it reflects the fact that on October 19th, 1941, a German torpedo sank a US merchant ship in Atlantic waters. The American public was outraged just as they had been years earlier when the Germans sunk the Lusitania. So by this time, the Post Dispatch and Fitzpatrick had abandoned the isolationist tendencies we saw at the beginning of our presentation and the following editorial reflects a new attitude. And I'm gonna just read a section from the editorial that ran the day before this cartoon. Quote, Hitler for a long time was scrupulously careful to avoid incidents with the United States of war making potentiality. Evidently, he has now embarked upon a systematic attack upon our shipping as well as Britain's. He must now realize that the United States is actually engaged in naval warfare in the Atlantic and that the country's determination to safeguard the bridge of ships carrying supplies to Britain will never be shaken. Our Navy is trim and fit. It will give better than it takes. We are in the battle for the Atlantic for the duration and there can be no doubt about the outcome. So Fitzpatrick's cartoon published the next day is that reflects the resolve that we feel in this editorial. We see this looming ship labeled US Bridge of Ships and it dwarfs and overwhelms the shark shaped German torpedo below. 
Now, this is a quite a powerful cartoon. It is titled Die Wacht um Europe, which is German for The Watch Over Europe. And it ran on October 14th, 1941. It depicts a skeletal Nazi sentry watching over Europe. And the allegory aptly represents the murderous and tyrannical rule Adolf Hitler's Germany exerted over much of Europe in October of 1941. Now the title, Die Wacht am Europe, makes reference to a famous patriotic German poem slash song entitled Die Wacht am Rhein, The Watch Over the Rhine. And this song became a popular nationalistic anthem rallying Germans to keep watch over the Rhine River border with France. Now the words from the poem slash song are inscribed on the base of this monument, which is called Der Niederwald Denkmal. It's a famous German monument on the Rhine River featuring a colossal figure of Germania watching over the river. And here I show you two views of the sculpture. So for those who knew this sculpture, Fitzpatrick's sinister image would have a very chilling effect. So this is the final cartoon of part one. It's entitled Plight of Europe's Cradle of Liberty. And it ran on November 26th, 1941. And as you probably know, the country of France had been unable to defend herself from Hitler's forces and had signed an armistice with Germany on June 22nd, 1940, which had divided the nation into an occupied northern zone and a supposedly neutral southern zone controlled by Philippe Pétain in the city of Vichy. Now, by November 1941, Vichy France had become a puppet state and Fitzpatrick pictures the nation under the white flag of surrender. Handcuffs are wrapped around the flagpole and the flag itself is emblazoned with the name of the French city of Vichy, but a swastika has replaced the sea. So this brings us to part two of our story, the United States enters the war. And as we all know, on December 7th, 1941, the Japanese empire bombed the United States Hawaiian military base at Pearl Harbor. The US Congress declared war on Japan the next day. Three days later, on December 11th, 1941, Germany and Italy declared war on America and the United States responded in kind. So this is the first cartoon of part two. It's entitled, Hands Across the World, and it ran on December 11th, 1941, documenting the day Germany declared war on the United States. So Daniel Fitzpatrick visualizes the Axis alliance against the allies as two bloody hands, one German and one Japanese, joining in a Nazi salute across the globe. The following words come from an the editorial, So Be It, that ran alongside the cartoon in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. Quote, Adolf Hitler, who thinks himself ruler of Earth, declared war on the United States today in an address to his puppet Reichstag. At the same time, Hitler's despicable partner in the Axis, Benito Mussolini, announced to a crowd in the streets of Rome that Italy also was at war with America. These anticlimactic challenges were met promptly by President Roosevelt in a special message to Congress and by, by co and message to Congress and by action in Congress itself. So be it. Now this cartoon ran a couple of days later and it sort of goes with uh, the first cartoon hands across the world. It is entitled other hands across the world and has a slightly more optimistic tone. Uh, this one uh, ran on December 13th, 1941. And after Pearl Harbor, the United States had joined an alliance with Britain and Russia against the Axis powers. Also joining was China, which had been fighting Japan since 1937. 
So this alliance would be formally established as the United Nations on January 1st, 1942. So when you see World War II era discussions of the United Nations, they mean this alliance. Now Fitzpatrick's cartoon anticipates this formal alliance as the allied nations reach across the, goal, the globe to hold each other's hands and support each other in the alliance. Now, one of the things I like about uh, working on these exhibitions and, and programs is I always learn something. And this cartoon reflects uh, an opportunity to learn something new about World War II for me. Uh, this one is entitled New Version of Mexico's Great Seal, and it ran on May 27th, 1942. And what I didn't know was in May of 1942, German U-boats sank two Mexican ships in the West Atlantic, which prompted the Mexican president to support a declaration of war on the Axis powers. And now this decision was formalized on June 1st, 1942, but Fitzpatrick uh, anticipates that the alliance is coming and he celebrates uh, this new alliance with a variation on the Great Seal of Mexico, which you see in color uh, below. Now in the cartoon, an eagle perched on a cactus seizes not a rattlesnake, but a Hitler-headed swastika snake in its beak. And the Post-Dispatch described the alliance as follows, quote, the United, the United States welcomes its Southern neighbor as an ally particularly because it helps establish hemispheric solidarity as a real and potent force. The Mexican decision is a direct proof of the good neighbor policy's success. And this brings us to our next cartoon entitled Spring Target, which ran on April 19th, 1942. And during this period, the United States had successfully bombed a number of Japanese targets, including Tokyo. Now these bombings were launched from aircraft carriers and the fact that they happened really boosted US morale because the United States was feeling pretty negative about the way the war was going up until this point. It also warned Japan that the US was a formidable foe. So Fitzpatrick marked the occasion with an image of a bomb falling onto this octopus shaped uh, Japanese war flag creature that has the face of Japanese prime minister Tojo. Now, unfortunately, Tojo became the face of Imperial Japan in US propaganda and his buck teeth became an element of these offensive racial stereotypes that we often see in cartoons and other forms of propaganda. Uh, we can't excuse uh, this sort of thing, but it is part of our history. Uh, coming over the horizon is our next cartoon and it appeared on May 14, 1942. And during this period, allied powers began to feel that the tide of the war might be turning in their favor. So here, Fitzpatrick visualizes the Allies' hopes as a tank labeled U.S. production. The tank surges over the horizon, bringing ordnance and supplies, as well as troops to both the European and Asian fronts. So the United States entry gave hope uh, to the al Allies elsewhere. Now, this cartoon I really like. It is a cartoon about the African theater of the war, which the US was involved with. The title is What New Pages of History for Old Egypt? And it ran on June 25th, 1942. Now, on that date, the front page of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch displayed the headline, Rommel's forces smash 60 miles into Egypt. So uh, this uh, headline and the accompanying story reflected the Allies' worry that if the Nazis seized Egypt, 
they might also seize the strategically important Suez Canal and interfere with trade, etc. So Fitzpatrick represents Nazi troops behind the monumental Great Sphinx of Giza. Now, the mythical Sphinx is associated with deadly riddles. So the image of its title, worded like a riddle, aptly symbolizes the uncertainty and danger of the situation. I think it's just a great cartoon in its kind of subtlety there. Now, this count takes us to another cartoon uh, from May 21st, 1942, entitled Mine Worry. Now, at this time, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch had just published the day before a cartoon, a, a, an editorial titled Second Front in the Making. And I just want to read you a little uh, segment of that editorial. Quote, a second front is in the making in Europe. The United States and Great Britain are getting set for their own spring offensive as Hitler makes his bid for the Caucasus and the Russians in turn are closing in. The strike against Hitler now in the West will not only take pressure off the Red Army, but will also put the Fuhrer into the one situation which he admittedly fears with a mortal fear, a two front European war. So we, here we have the next cartoon, which is entitled, Evidence is Being Relentlessly Piled Up, President Roosevelt. And this ran on October 16, 1942. On October 13, 1942, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch published the complete text of President Franklin Roosevelt's October 12th radio address to the nation. The speech included the following warning to Nazi war criminals, quote, the allies have decided to establish the identity of those Nazi leaders who are responsible for the innumerable acts of savagery. As each of these criminal deeds is committed, it is being carefully investigated and evidence is being relentlessly piled up for the future purposes of justice. So Fitzpatrick characterizes the generic Nazi war criminal as an arrogant executioner surrounded by accusatory fingers calling him to account for his crimes. Now this cartoon is I think one of the most powerful in the entire collection of Fitzpatrick World War II cartoons. It's just really haunting this imagery. It's entitled Gateway to Stalingrad and it ran on November 25th, 1942. Now between August 23rd, 1942 and February 2nd, 1943, the Axis powers fought the Russian Red Army for control of the city of Stalingrad in Southern Russia. With over 2 million fighters, over a million casualties, the counter remains the largest and bloodiest battle in the history of warfare. So Fitzpatrick's cartoon depicts Nazi troops entering a giant's death head, dubbed the gateway to Stalingrad. And this image foreshadows the Germans' heavy losses and eventual defeat. So this is the last cartoon in part two, and it's entitled End of Act One. It ran on May 9th, 1943. Now, beginning in June of 1940, the Axis and Allied forces were fighting in North Africa for control of resources and trade routes. By November of 1942, the Allies had introduced over 120,000 British and American forces into the campaign. And this surge led the Vichy French in Africa to change sides and cooperate with the Allies. And the Axis powers eventually surrendered in May of 1943. This is um, one of the subjects of the movie Casablanca, if you're familiar with that. Uh, so Fitzpatrick represents this defeat as a giant swastika falling into the sea. 
and a May 8th editorial in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch articulates the guarded optimism envisioned in this cartoon. Quote, in the United States, in England, in embattled Russia, in all the United Nations, this is a day of jubilation. It celebrates the first great offensive victory of our arms in the West. We are now indeed on the march. There must be a new fear trembling today in Berlin and Rome and in Tokyo too. The day draws nearer for their unconditional surrender. And so we move on to part three, the final years of World War II. Now, by the summer of 1943, the United States and its allies had slowed the progress of the Axis powers in Europe and the Pacific. Germany and Japan, however, would not surrender without a fight, and the war continued until the spring slash summer of 1945. So this is the first of our cartoons in this section. It's entitled Looter Number no. One, and it ran on May 10th, 1943. Now, in the spring of that year, reports of rampant looting by Germans in occupied countries reached the U.S. The Nazis were seizing agricultural, technological, and cultural goods in conquered territories. And there were reports of Germans kidnapping men and women in these nations for use as slave labor. An editorial in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch titled Plunderer of Plunderers appeared the day before Fitzpatrick published Looter Number no. One. It described the horrific extent of Nazi plunder as follows, quote, art galleries and museums have been stripped. The occupied countries have been despoiled of machines, furniture and garden tools with equal ruthlessness. Even their working men and their daughters have been led into the Reich. So this is our next cartoon, which ran on September 7th, 1943, and its title is simply Heil. Fitzpatrick pictures the Nazi leader, Adolf Hitler, confronted by the specter of death, who is seeking Heil uh, to the Fuhrer. So when this cartoon ran on September 7th, 1943, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch had recently reported on numerous Nazi defeats and setbacks. British troops had successfully launched an invasion of Nazi-occupied Italy on September 3rd. The Soviet Union was gaining ground on the Eastern Front and deadly allied air raids into Germany were weakening that nation's infrastructure and morale. Fitzpatrick's cartoon suggests that the end of Hitler's rule was near and that ultimately the Nazis' only spoils were carnage and death. This cartoon kind of has a similar feel to it. Uh, this is entitled Outlook for the Murderers and it ran on November 7th, 1943. Now it refers very specifically to a speech given on November 6th, 1943 by the premier of the Soviet Union, Joseph Stalin, who addressed the people of the allied countries from Moscow. The speech was published in translation in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch on November 7th, uh, the day this cartoon ran, and it predicted the eventual Allied victory and promised to hold the Nazis accountable for their war crimes. And I'll quote Stalin, the more hopeless the position of the Hitlerites becomes, the more viciously they rage in atrocities and plunder. Our people will not forgive the German fiends for these crimes. We shall make the German criminals answer for all their misdeeds. So in Outlook for the Murderers, Fitzpatrick visualizes the future of German war criminals by showing a marauding Nazi framed by a hangman's noose. Now, speaking of war crimes, but this time in the Pacific, uh, this cartoon is titled More Than Baton to Remember, and it, it ran on January 29th, 1944. But it actually represents an event that took place in the spring of 1943, 
when the Japanese forcibly marched 60 to 80,000 American and Filipino prisoners of war over 60 miles from the city of Bataan to POW camps further north in the Philippines. Estimates of the number of deaths that occurred during this march range from between 6,000 to 18,000. And though the march took place in April of 1943, the public in the US only became aware of it on January 27, 1944. And on January 28th, an editorial in the, in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch reacted to reports of the Bataan Death March. So Fitzpatrick's image appears shortly thereafter, and it represents a giant bloody hand with the rayed sun of the Japanese war flag emblazoned on its cuff, creating a powerful emblem of the Death March and other war crimes associated with Imperial Japan. New Tide in the Pacific is our next cartoon dated February 10th, 1944. And it reflects the fact that during the winter of 1943-44, the United States and its allies achieved a series of victories over the Japanese empire in the Pacific theater, specifically in the islands. Now in this cartoon, Fitzpatrick represents the surface of a wave covered with the stars and stripes of the American flag. This cresting wave becomes a metaphor for the idea that the United States was becoming a more powerful force in the Pacific. Now this cartoon, which dates to June 10th, 1944, represents one of the most important iconic uh, events of the war. Uh, it is titled, It Couldn't Be Done. And as I said, it was uh, printed on June 10th, 1944, and it represents D-Day. So this uh, Atlantic wall you're seeing here, that reflects the fact that between 1942 and 1944, Nazi Germany built fortifications along the coasts of their European territories vulnerable to seaborne attacks from the Atlantic Ocean, English Channel, and the North Sea. Now, the Nazis claimed that this stretch of defenses that they called the Atlantic Wall could not be broken. But on D-Day, June 6, 1944, Allied forces crossed the English Channel and launched a successful invasion of France from the beaches of Normandy. So Fitzpatrick represents the invasion symbolically picturing throngs of troops and tanks pouring through a breach in the mighty Atlantic wall. And you can get uh, an image of this cartoon uh, on Amazon for $32.83. And this image seems to have been taken out of newspapers.com or something. And of course, isn't anywhere nearly as good as our image, which represents the original cartoon. So uh, instead of playing 3283, uh, come to us for an image of this uh, wonderful D-Day cartoon. Now this cartoon also has something to do with D-Day and it ran on June 14th in 1944. It's entitled Little Man What Now? And it depicts an exhausted Adolf Hitler leaning on a crossroads sign. One sign points to Normandy, where the Allies had recently landed and were advancing towards Paris. Another points to Russia, where the Nazis were being pushed back relentlessly by the Red Army. A third sign points to Italy, where the fall of Rome just two days before D-Day presaged the Nazis' ultimate defeat. And the final sign, the air, points upward. And by 1944, the Allies had destroyed much of Germany's aerial infrastructure, particularly in the West, where the US and Britain controlled the skies. Now, things were looking better in Europe, and they were looking better in Asia too in 1944, but uh, things were still uh, quite uh, rough on the China front. And this particular cartoon uh, reflects that. It's titled The Plight of China, and it ran on September 13th, 1944. 
So Japan still had the advantage on the Chinese front and were conducting an embargo and really starving China out. So Fitzpatrick visualizes this state of affairs in plight of China, which ran in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch two days after the appearance of the following account by journalist A.T. Steele reporting from a quote, far Eastern base. And this is really powerful. So I wanna read, read you from that report. Quote, no report on China can be fair or objective unless written against the background of the exhausting gory ordeal through which the Chinese people have struggled since July 7th, 1937. Their people have been slaughtered like flies. They have seen the best parts of their country overrun by the invaders. No country in this war has suffered so heavy a loss of life. China has not collapsed, nor is it likely that it will. But until the Japanese blockade is effectively breached, China will grow weaker and weaker. Eventually, uh, the Japanese were defeated and this cartoon reflects uh, that moment when it became obvious uh, that the war was near its end. It's entitled A New Era in Man's Understanding of Nature's Forces, President Truman, and it ran on August 7th, 1945. And as uh, most of you know, on August 6th, 1945, the Atomic Age began when the United States dropped the atom bomb on Hiroshima, Japan. The next day, Fitzpatrick's cartoon represented the importance of the atomic bomb, not only as an instrument that would likely bring an end to World War II, but also as a new and powerful force that would require sober and responsible leadership to harness. The image of a human hand striking the earth with a lightning bolt together with the title, quoting President Truman, creates a powerful image and a warning. This cartoon actually appeared next to an editorial entitled, A Decision for Mankind, which acknowledged the potential of the bomb to end the war and change the world. And this is just a, a quote from that uh, editorial, quote, now we have gone to a new ultimate in the tools of power. Either the world's people, our own included, will learn to use it not for war, but for peace, or else science has signed the mammalian world's death warrant. Now, World War II did eventually end on August 14th 15th, 1945, depending on your time zone, when the Japanese accepted the Allies' terms for an unconditional surrender. Now these days, as well as September 2nd, the date of the formal surrender, have all been associated with VJ Day, or Victory Over Japan Day. So there's a, several different days that people talk about when they say VJ Day. Uh, but this particular cartoon uh, reflects that August 14th, 15th date. And to commemorate this event, Fitzpatrick depicted a male figure on his knees raising his arms to form a V for victory. The man's kneeling pose and the title V for Thanksgiving suggests an element of humility in the Allies' triumph. Thankful for the war's end, but not boastfully triumphant, most Americans believed their soldiers and sailors fought not for gain, but to stop genocide, imperialism, and oppression. And as an ironic finale to this presentation, I must report that although V for Thanksgiving was scheduled to appear in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch on August 16, 1945, the day after VJ Day, the cartoon was not published because between August 16th and September 7th, 1945, the newspaper suspended publication due to a strike by the St. Louis newspaper carriers and pressmen. This United Press story printed in another paper reports, quote, a strike was called today against the three St. Louis newspapers by the AF of L's paper carriers union. Because of the strike, 
pressmen employed by the Post-Dispatch and the Star Times afternoon papers and the Morning Globe Democrat failed to report. And so we end Fitzpatrick's story of World War II with an unpublished image, an image that was not published because at last the US no longer feared domination by totalitarian powers. Domestic and local issues once again became the dominant concerns of St. Louisans. And that concludes uh, today's uh, presentation. And thank you so much for listening. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Joan, for sharing all of that great content with us. Thank you so much to everyone for joining us and uh, keep an eye on our website uh, for future programs and events. And we'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks so much, Joan. Thank you.